What is our word of the year? Divine design. Come on, what's the word of the year? Divine design. I believe God has a divine design for every single person in this room. And we're in the middle of a series right now. It's titled Practicing the Way. And it's all about what does it, what does it mean to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, a Christian, an apprentice, and it's a book actually by John Mark Comer, Practicing the Way. I encourage you to get it. It's a wonderful book. But we've been in this, and the steps are we got to spend time with Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. we got to become like Jesus. Pastor Sarah preached a message last week, Becoming Like Jesus. It was unbelievable. Put your hands together for Pastor Sarah right now. It was incredible. And today, I'm excited because I get to preach we get to do what Jesus did, right? If we're going to be followers of Jesus, practice the way we got to do what Jesus did those three glorious years of his ministry on earth, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father. We got to be like Jesus and do as he did. Bow your head, and come on, let's pray. God, we love you. We praise your name. Thank you for North Point Community Church, God. I pray that your word will wash over us and transform us. Help us to be disciples and followers of you like never before. And everybody said amen, amen and amen. You know, I just, I love being in the house of God. How many of you love being in the house of God? It's just wonderful. I'm looking out today. Hey, y'all are ready. I can tell. Y'all ready? Y'all ready for the word of God today? Come on, let's do this. I just want to give you a quick recap. To follow Jesus, it's to become his apprentice. Is to become his disciple, his follower. So everyone in this place, you are following something, okay? You're not an original and not unchanged, no. You are being influenced and shaped by something or someone. You are following what we call a rabbi. In Jesus' day, a rabbi was a Jewish leader of the religion, of, of, of the faith that had followers. So if you were an apprentice, you would train under a rabbi in order one day to become a rabbi yourself. So at the end of your training, you wanted to hear, all right, buddy, you've done a great job. Now you go do what I've done and get yourself your own disciples. That's what you'd want to hear. In the New Testament, the word Christian, it's only used three times but the word disciple or apprentice, it's used 269 times. That's what we are to be, disciples, followers of Jesus. And Jesus' closing words to his followers, his apprentices, it was, go and make other apprentices of all kinds of people. And this is exactly what you would expect to hear from your rabbi. Go do as I have done. The book of Acts, it's just that. It's Jesus' disciples, his followers, carrying on Jesus' way, healing people, raising people from the dead, casting out demons, doing as Jesus did. And this is what you would expect. This is what we see in really every walk of life. I mean, if you're a plumber apprentice, if you're a medical student, a law student, you don't just apprentice and study to learn the stuff. no. You apprentice to learn how to do the stuff. So when you're finished, you want to be able to practice in the craft that you have been learning. Another way to see this is Jesus is the prototype. Jesus was called the first fruits in the New Testament. So in their day, the first fruits, this was the first buds of the fall harvest that represented what's about to erupt in mass all over the place. So Jesus, he is the first fruits. He's the first sign of what's coming for all of his followers. Some scholars translate the Greek prototype, the first of a whole new kind of human. Can I get an amen? So how did Jesus get his power? Well, through the Holy Spirit. You know, just like Sarah talked last week, Jesus said this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight 
for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Can I get an amen? amen. Jesus did what he did by drawing on the connection to the capacities of God. Jesus did what he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. The same power that Jesus had, we have access to do what Jesus did. Let me tell you, that's what we're talking about today. Do what Jesus did. We're going to jump off in John 14, 12. If you got your Bibles, turn there or look on the screen. But Jesus said this to his followers to his apprentices, and he said it to you and to me. This is what Jesus said. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes, everyone say whoever. Whoever, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things. Everyone say greater. greater. Because I'm going to the Father. Whoever believes will do what I've done and will do Greater things. You know, a lot of scholars disagree on what greater things means, and they just, they don't really have anything that they agree on. But the one thing they do agree on is that greater things does not mean lesser things. Greater things does not mean smaller things. And the other thing that they agree on is the whosoever believes means whosoever believes. How many of you believe in this place? And that whosoever believes is the same whosoever believes in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. How many of you experience that whosoever? How many of you believe that whosoever? Let me tell you, if you believe that whosoever, you better believe this, that God has called us to greater things. And the only way we can do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, Jesus, he's looking for some some disciples today. He's looking for some apprentices today, some followers that say, I want to be a part of the whosoever and to do the greater things. And you might say, what did Jesus even do? Well, Comer, he categorizes what Jesus did in three rhythms. And I love these rhythms. This is what we're going to follow today. It is, number one, making space for the gospel, preaching the gospel, and demonstrating the gospel. Now, before you just, you know, tune out and say, that's above my pay grade, I can't do all that stuff. No, I'm telling you, if you're a brand new Christian, or if you've been doing this a really long time, I'm going to show you that we can do as Jesus did. Amen? All right, rhythm number one, making space for the gospel. So talking about this point, it's almost like a full message on hospitality, right? Hospitality, if someone's great at hospitality, they're wonderful at inviting people over, you know, setting a table, making people feel comfortable, making spaces where people can have conversation, creating spaces where people can have community, right? Creating space, hospitable. How often in the Bible do we see Jesus sitting down to eat with people or he's just hanging out with people? I mean, in the book of Luke, there's over 50 references to food. I mean, Jesus, this guy, he's either going to a meal, coming from a meal, or he's sitting down, he's eating a meal. I mean, Jesus, he was a foodie. That's, that's the Jesus I see right here. I want to believe, you know, in Jesus' spirit deep down, Jesus was really a Cajun. Can I get an amen, somebody? Come on. And the Bible I read, Jesus liked crawfish, and Jesus liked them really hot. Come on. You're like, I haven't read that. Well, keep reading. You're going to find that in the Bible. You're going to find it. So in Jesus' day, A rabbi sitting with somebody, this was monumental. Okay, a rabbi sitting with someone, that means the rabbi was accepting them as as his family and his community and with his God. In the Jewish culture, this was a big deal. So Jesus, the rabbi, who did he sit with? Tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners. 
if any other rabbi did this, they would have lost their job. And a lot of people feel like Jesus was crucified and killed because of the tables he set up, because of the people he invited to his table. That cute little story about the wee little man Zacchaeus. Y'all know that story, right? That's a cute story. His little guy, and he climbs up a tree, and Jesus invites. It's a wonderful, it's a cute thing. It's not cute. It's offensive. Because for the Jewish community, they said, this guy is, he's betrayed us. He's not welcome with us. We have outcast Zacchaeus. But Jesus said, no, no, I'm going to make him feel welcome. He has space at my table. Other rabbis use the table as a boundary marker, place to say, you're not of my kind. You're not welcome. Jesus used it to accept the whosoever, to accept everybody. You know, you see this throughout this first rhythm. Make space for the gospel. Go read the stories of Jesus. You know, he's, he's constantly doing this. He's creating space. Like I said with the tax collectors, he had many Tax collector friends, everyone else, they were outraged at them. And Jesus said, no, I want you to feel comfortable at my table. The prostitute woman that brought the alabaster box, Jesus was at a dinner with an uppity crowd, but it appears that even when Jesus is sitting with people, he leaves the lane for others to be able to make their way to him because this woman got to Jesus, and the others would have rejected her. But Jesus looked down upon her, and he blessed her. He said, you're welcome. You're accepted at my table. I love a story of um, when Jesus is preaching. When Jesus preached, there was a group that gathered around Jesus. I mean, he drew a crowd. He's in someone's home, and, and the crowd came. It is stacked in this home, so much so that you know the story. There's Four friends that have a lame friend, and they want to bring him to Jesus for a miracle, but they can't get in the door because there's so many people. There's no space. They climb up on the roof, and they rip the roof off that place and lower their friend down to Jesus. They make space for their friend to get to Jesus, and Jesus loved it. He healed their friend. He gave their friend salvation. I want to tell you this. If you're desperate to create space for anything in your life, you better be desperate to create space for Jesus, create space for the gospel. That's really what we do here at North Point Community Church. That's what we do. I mean, this is a space that has been created for us together and celebrate the gospel of Jesus. Community groups, they're groups all throughout the week, men, women, couples, youth, Kids, why? People sit around tables. They sit in groups, and they create a space where we can experience Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, create space for Jesus. Not only did he create space, and we're to create space, but whenever Jesus spoke, it was the word of God. Whenever he spoke, it was scriptures. He gave incredible testimonies. He was the walking, living word of God, but he was the most incredible orator and preacher, I believe, and he spoke it out, and that's what we're to do as well. Here's rhythm number two, preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel. You know, you might have just tuned out and you said, nope, not me, I'm not a preacher. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. All right, everyone in this place, you're preaching a gospel of some kind. And that gospel is your truth that you believe and your experiences that have transformed you. And you're great at sharing it. I see you. You are sharing the go- your gospel, your truth that you've experienced. Anytime you're talking, you're preaching. You know, I see, I see you out there, and it's amazing to me how many pickleball preachers there are in Bozier. It's like... Pickleball apostles, I'm telling you. It's like pickleball is the fastest growing sport in America. You can play if you're old or young. You go real fast, and it's like doesn't hurt you. You can play the first day. It's like I didn't ask for that. Like why are you witnessing to me about pickleball? Like you just feel free. Well, it's because you share what's transformed you. You share the experiences 
that made a difference in your life. And this isn't a condemning moment. This is an exciting moment because take inventory of what you're saying. That's what you're preaching. And if you're speaking more about the sports and politics, if you're talking more about Taylor Swift, if you're getting into all these different things and you're not talking about Jesus, well, how about this? You get to go and you experience Jesus. You spend time with Jesus. You let him transform your life. And then the thing that spills over in conversation is Jesus has transformed my life. And it's your truth. It's your gospel. That's what everyone does. We talk about telling everyone about the thing that's captivated us. If something actually alleviates your stress and your depression, I see you. You tell people about it. Something so funny, you know, it tickles you and you're just laughing about it all week long. And it's the funniest. You're, you're sharing that with somebody. If you have something that helps the arthritis in your life, you are telling somebody about it. This is just what people do. They talk about what they believe in, what they've experienced, and what they love the most. So the question, it's not, are you preaching the gospel it's what gospel are you preaching? What good news do you spend your time telling people about? Because if we're followers of the way, if we are apprentices, well, we're following Jesus so close, we get the dust of his sandals on our clothes and we are with him. We've got to love Jesus the most. We've got to spend time with Jesus the most. So that's the thing that spills over. And I just want to take the pressure off of you. We're to be witnesses. Preaching the gospel is basically just giving your testimony or, or being like a witness in a trial. And Comer says it this way. It's okay because we're not responsible for the outcomes any more than a witness is responsible for the ruling of a trial. So take the pressure off. It's not you that transforms anybody. It's Jesus that draws. It's Jesus that transforms we're a witness, and then Jesus has got to do all the work anyway. And here's the thing. Don't assume that people aren't ready to listen to the gospel. Now, so many times an unbeliever, we see an unbeliever, and it's like, they're godless. God is not in them whatsoever. Stay away from them. They're not ready. It's like, no. Take the opposite approach and believe God is working in their life. Believe God has planted some seeds and watered those seeds. Find where God is working and join in. Once again, too many times we have the assumption that God is not where unbelievers are. And what if we had the opposite assumption? What if we assumed God is moving? God is drawing them with his love. God is drawing them with his mercy and grace. And we find where he is moving and we simply join in. So I just, I want you to take account of your words. And the whole thing is, experience Jesus so much that Jesus is what spills out. And find where Jesus is working. And just join in. Amen? So, we got to create space for Jesus. That's what Jesus did. We've got to preach the gospel, share your testimony. Here's, here's the last rhythm. How many of you would agree Jesus was a walking demonstration of the power of Almighty God? Everywhere he went, he was demonstrating the power through the Holy Spirit, through incredible works. And here's what we've got to do. Rhythm number three is this, demonstrating the gospel. So here, don't ever forget what Jesus said should be happening in the lives of the whosoever that choose to believe in him. It's our main text today. They should be doing greater works. Everyone say greater, greater. than Jesus himself. That's a pretty intimidating statement right there, right? I mean, it's easy to read, but it's hard to believe. But it's also what we're called to throughout scripture. So in Matthew 25, Jesus talked about the whosoever Believes. How many of you believe in Jesus in this place? How many of you? Just raise your hand. If, how many whoso? Okay, so this applies to you. The whosoever believes, we would be the ones that demonstrate 
through feeding the hungry, through clothing the naked, through visiting the prisoners and give the homeless a place to rest. I just want to thank you, North Point Community Church, for doing this. Because of your generosity, thousands of students here in Bossier have meals. They have clothes because of what you have given. Come on, put your hands together for yourselves right now. You're demonstrating the gospel. And then it goes on. In the Great Commission, Jesus said that the whosoever believes, that's you that raised your hand, minister the sick and make them well. Pray for miracles and see them unfold right before their eyes. Challenge darkness without fear. Help people shake loose and are delivered and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit doing what Jesus did. For a lot of you, all those words, that's just religious jargon. It's like, Denny, I could never do that. I don't have faith. Well, let me simplify this for you today. What I mean is, if you just can't fathom and see yourself doing these things like healing the sick, casting out devils, working signs and wonders, miracles, even raising the dead, I want to take the pressure off. It's not you that does that anyway. It's the Holy Spirit through you. And it all starts with this one step that I'm going to give you that's the greatest demonstration of God's power. And that is simply stop and pray for somebody. Prayer is the strongest demonstration and the beginning step of all these things that God wants to do. Now, ser seriously, just stop and pray. Like, I can't do that, Denny. Well, start by praying for yourself. Pray that God will help you, and then, and then go the next step. Pray with your spouse. Make a safe place with your family to bring prayer in the mix. And then maybe you'll get to a point when you're talking to one of your friends and they tell you something devastating that's happening in their life and you don't have an answer for it, but you stop and say, you know what? I know Jesus has the answer. And can I just pray for you really quick? People usually do not turn down prayer. And in that moment, you pray, opening the door for the demonstration of the Holy Spirit to move. You know, my grandfather, Pastor Rodney Duran, he was my hero, and he's the reason that really I'm in um, ministry today. And today is an exciting day. It is Celebration Sunday. Can you put your hands together for Celebration Sunday? Come on. Hey, everyone that's getting baptized right now, can you go ahead and go to the back? Put your hands together for everyone that's getting baptized. Come on. We got some baptisms. This is an exciting day. It's an incredible day. Man, we honor you guys. We're about to get you up here. It's going to be a fun time. Come on, somebody. You know, my grandfather, I love him so much. And he was a great demonstration of God's power. And it's really through prayer. He was a man of prayer. So he would go to hospitals. And he would pray for our members. But then he would go from room to room. And people that weren't even in our church would say, hey, I'm Pastor Rodney. Can I pray for you? Most times, people won't turn down prayer. They say, yes, you can pray for them. Do you know my grandfather has been in heaven for 11 years now? And still to this day, I'll walk around this city, and I'll get testimonies that sound a little something like this. Hey, I knew your grandfather. He, he came out. I didn't even go to your church. But your grandfather was an incredible man. He prayed for me one day, and after he prayed for me, it changed my life. He prayed for me, and God gloriously healed me. And they'll say, I never even got to tell your grandfather this, but I just wanted to let you know what incredible moment he gave me. Here's the thing. When you stop and simply pray for somebody, you'll be a part of some of the demonstrations of God's power, and you won't even know it until you get to heaven. One of my favorite stories, the story of our friend, his name is Hassan, Haas. And have you ever been around somebody where they just they have so much energy? It's like, whoa. Like, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can keep up with that. Like, Haas is just, he's so much fun. It's kind of overwhelming, you know. And the first time my dad met Haas, 
was at Austin's gas station right down the street from dad's house. And dad walked in his gas station and immediately dad and Haas were buddies. And the first time dad met Haas, dad said, hey, what can I pray with you about right now? What do you need me to pray for you right now? And, and Haas said, well, for my business, that God will bless my business. And so the very next time that dad came in to um, the gas station, there was a line of people like all the way out the store. It was insane. And as soon as Haas saw my dad, he screamed out in front of everyone, Pastor Denny, you prayed for me and look what God has done. He was just overwhelmed. A demonstration of God's power. So they became friends and Haas found out, this Muslim man, that dad was a pastor. And one day he said, hey, why don't you tell me about your God? Like, tell me about it. And something just hit my dad. In his spirit, he felt God say, no, not yet. So he told him, hey, not yet, Haas. Let's just, I want to hear about your family. I want to tell you about mine. Let's just be buddies. And they would sit around, have food together, and hang out. He was creating a space for the gospel. Not long after that, dad was standing on stage on an Easter Sunday morning, and dad he preached the Easter message, preached the gospel. And after his message, he looks down, and who's there? Haas is standing. He gave his life to Jesus at that altar that day. Haas texts my dad after, and he said, Now I know, I know why you didn't share the gospel with me immediately. He said, if you had, I would have always wondered, did you just talk me into this thing? And he said, but now I see the answer in John 3, 16. Whosoever believes, and that same whosoever believes is the one that says, you're to do the same thing Jesus did in greater works. I want you to stand to your feet, and I just want to ask you a question, and I want to pray for you. And then we're going to baptize some people today. What I've been saying today is I've made it as applicable and functional for you as I possibly can. But what I'm preaching today, it's not easy stuff, okay? It's going to cost you something. Jesus said it this way. He said, take up your cross. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and the shame and the suffering. That means you're going to have to sacrifice something to follow Jesus. For Haas, when he gave his life to Jesus, when he was water baptized, what he had to sacrifice were some friends and a lot of family members, but what he gained was something greater than he could ever imagine. I want you to bow your head right now. I just want to ask you this question. What are you going to have to sacrifice in order to create space for the gospel? What are you going to have to surrender in order to start sharing the gospel? That's the thing that overflows in your life. What are you going to have to give up to start demonstrating the gospel? We got to follow Jesus. We got to do as Jesus did. Some of you in this place, you need to give your life to Jesus right now. And I want to give you that opportunity. Every head bowed right now. I want to ask you this. How many in this place need to give their life to Jesus? You say, man, I'm not walking in this. I want access to doing like Jesus. I want to give Jesus my life today. How many of you need to rededicate your life? Maybe you're on the fence. You don't quite know and... You just, you're ready to go all in. If you want to give your life to Jesus today, or if you simply want to rededicate your life, today's the day of your salvation. You can't wait. Raise your hand right now if you want to give your life to Jesus. And I want to pray for you. Raise your hand right now if you want to give your life to Jesus. Come on. 
Give me one more moment. Thank you, Jesus. Raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Everyone repeat after me. Jesus, come into my life. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross and you rose on the third day. Forgive me of my sins. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. Help me to create space for you. Help me to talk about you. Help me to demonstrate your love. I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to love you more than anything. I want to be your disciple. I want to be your apprentice. Look and listen to me right now. If you prayed that prayer, I believe Jesus just became the Lord and Savior of your life. This is monumental. It's the best day of your life. But it's not simply like we've been talking in this series, not just pray a prayer and boop, it's all done. No, it begins. It begins the life, the journey of following, of discipling, and being an apprentice of Jesus. You might say, what's the next step? Your very next step is water baptism. Your next step is water baptism. Now, here's the thing. We're about to dunk some people right here. Can I get an amen? Come on, somebody. And it's going to be unbelievable. But for those of you that have never been water baptized, and those of you that just gave your life to Jesus, right now, I want to open this up for you to have an opportunity to do this. So if you want to get water baptized, you can go out that back door and someone's going to meet you and take you, give you a towel, give you a shirt, and you need to get to home. You're going to go home soaking wet today. Can I get an amen? Come on. So right now, if you want to get baptized, just go out the back door. Come on, put your hands together for the water baptism today. Today is Celebration Sunday. Now, everybody else, I want to tell you this. This is our moment. And I want the band to come. We're just going to sing a couple choruses. And then we're going to get into these water baptisms. I want you to raise your hand right now with me. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Say, Jesus, I surrender to you. Say, Jesus, I give it all to you. Jesus, I want to follow you. Say, you're my everything. Right now as we worship, I just want you to give Jesus your best worship. and Just tell him how much you love him. Come on, let's all worship together.